Good evening and welcome to TDM Talk Show. The world commemorates Holocaust Remembrance Day on Saturday, the 27th of January. It's a time to pause to remember the millions who have been murdered or whose lives have been changed beyond recognition. Our guest has been in the forefront of promoting Holocaust studies, Jewish culture and history in Macau and in the greater China region. Glenn Timmermans is an associate professor at the University of Macau's Department of English. Professor Timmermans, Glenn, thank you very much for joining us and welcome to the show. Good evening. Thank you, Jose. Good to see you. Thank you. You brought earlier this week to Macau uh, someone, a visitor, a survivor, I shall say, of uh, two of the most infamous Nazi concentration camps, Mr. Werner Reich, who is now 90 years old. Tell us about the significance of having him with us and uh, the interaction with students uh, and with the community. We we're very lucky to have Mr. Reich come from New York. Uh, as you say, he's 90 years old, and it's incredibly difficult nowadays to find Holocaust survivors. I mean, there are very few Holocaust survivors left. I mean, anybody who survived the Holocaust, who was in the camps, is obviously now, those who are still alive, are in their late 80s and 90s. So to get a 90-year-old gentleman to fly from New York all the way to Hong Kong and Macau is an achievement itself. But it's fantastic to have something like that come to Macau to meet students, because you can teach the Holocaust, you can see the Holocaust films, you can see the documentaries, but there's nothing like actually hearing directly or speaking to somebody who was actually there. Um, in, in 10 years, 20, 15 years' time, they'll all be gone. And our, our, our contact, our living link with this incredibly important event will be gone. Okay. No one alive today, there's no one alive today who was at the First World War. So already the First World War is going to become a, a distant memory because not a single person who was in the First World War is alive today. And while the Holocaust survivors are still around, the few that they are, it's fantastic to have them come and speak to students and, and the public. And you could, as we saw yesterday when Werner spoke twice in Macau, once at TIS and once at the university, mm -hmm. the impact it has on people to hear the story directly, it just makes the whole thing so much more real to them. And it's not something they've just read in a book or seen on a documentary. I guess you're concerned about what will happen in the future because with them, not anymore with us. Uh, are you worried that the new generations uh, will not truly understand what happened? I, I, there's, there's a fear. There's a fear that as, the, as the, the more time passes, the story will recede into history and it won't get the, the, the attention it, it deserves and it, it, it demands. Uh, Holocaust institutions, particularly uh, the, the Shoah Foundation in California, started by Steven Spielberg mm -hmm. with the profits made from Schindler's List, they've done a remarkable job. They've, after Schindler's List and very successful, made a lot of money, Spielberg took that money and he used it to hire thousands of people to find every single possible possible Holocaust and to record their in the world. oral history. And record their mm. interviews go on for hours, some of five, six, seven hours, a survivor telling their story. More recently, I, I was dealing with them only two weeks ago, they're now, I'm not sure how I feel about it, they're now developing holograms, holographs of survivors. So when the survivors are gone, they will be this virtual survivor. And mm. the way they've done it, they've interviewed the survivors they're doing this with, and they've asked them every possible question. And then you can ask the holograph, so tell me about which camps you're in, mm. and this holograph will then tell you. Well, and that's it's extraordinary. remarkable. It is extraordinary what they're doing. The how people will react to that, I don't know. At this stage, it's still a gimmick. So you're not sure whether it's the gimmickiness which is, which is attractive or the actual story. But that is something which is being developed at the moment as a way to try and... We can't keep the people alive, but we can try and allow future generations still to interact in some way with, with, with survivors. You've been tirelessly raising awareness on this, and you've been based in Macau uh, since 2001, am well I right? Well remembered. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, and you've been dedicating most of your time, I shall say, I, I shall assume that, to this cause. And, but tell us about your, throughout these years, the feedback that you've been getting from local, especially the younger generations, 
Macau based, Hong Kong based, mainland China, because you've been to mainland China a, a lot, number of times. Lot, yeah. um, do you see things improving in that respect? Uh, awareness being strengthened and a better understanding of history? I, th I think I do. I mean, I, uh, I think I'm not just being positive. Uh, when I first came to Macau, the reason the Holocaust has always been fascinating to me and a very important part of one's heritage, but I suppose I was quite shocked when I first came to Macau. Uh, teaching literature of the 20th century and students never heard of Auschwitz. You think, how can you understand the 20th century right. if you don't know about the seminal event? And so I first started teaching Holocaust within literary studies. And then I decided that even this wasn't enough. And so I then, I went to Israel, spent time studying, learning about how to teach the Holocaust um, as an educator. Uh, and then very fortunately, well, various things. I mean, the London Jewish Cultural Center no longer exists, but we started a, a separate thing called the International Center for Jewish Studies in London. We've been running programs in China every summer for the last 10 years. We spend about 10 days at a particular campus in China, and we have MA and PhD students in history and other, coming to the university where we are, and we spend 10 days on Jewish history and Holocaust studies. That's been doing for a long time. In 2011, we started the Hong Kong Holocaust and Tolerance Center, uh, from within the Jewish community in Hong Kong. And then more recently, the University of Macau introduced general education, and I came up with a course called Holocaust, Genocide, and Human Rights. And I said I, you've been drawing a uh, number of And I'm of pleased students. to say, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm really, really thrilled to say that it's, it's one of the courses for which there's always a waiting list. Um, okay. And last semester, I taught three classes of 72 each. This semester, I'm teaching two classes of 65 each. Um, it's a, it's a class which most students seem to find worth their while. Um, and one sees just yesterday, you, when you see all these students, a lot of the students there yesterday had taken the course. And so they're coming and meeting a survivor. And I think the way they engage with the survivor, they, they engage in a very informed way. They were asking intelligent questions. It wasn't the sort of questions people who, who knew nothing about the Holocaust might ask. These, these were people who wanted to know more. They'd learned about it, now they wanted to hear firsthand from, from a survivor about what they'd learned in class. The fact that in Hong Kong you have a well-established Jewish community, and you don't have in Macau because not there are, all. not at all, uh, that's a challenge for you, right? And how, how are you like um, bringing uh, and making the best out of the Jewish presence in Hong Kong so that Macau can also benefit? Particularly the Holocaust Center. I mean, any, anything we do in Hong Kong, I try to make sure we also bring to Macau. We haven't done everything. I mean, there are exhibitions which we do in Hong Kong. I'd like to bring to Macau. The film festival. The film festival. We used to do more. The thing is to find money. I mean, you know, the thing is, as a, as a Holocaust Center, we depend entirely on on on. Uh, charitable contribution. I mean, we don't get money from anyone other than from members of the community giving money. Um, until recently, we've been bringing films. I'd like to carry on doing that during, during the Jewish Film Festival. Uh, there are exhibitions I'd like to bring to Macau, but I need to find the means and the money to either transport the exhibition or republish the exhibition in, in, in Macau. Um, so... I think at this stage, there is certainly a spillover from what we're doing in Hong Kong, but I would, I would love to do much, much more in Macau. Uh, for instance, a few years ago, we organized a, a concert for, for Holocaust Memorial Day 2013. We organized a concert of music performed, music written in the concentration camps. Oh. You know, many great Jewish composers were sent to the camps, and before they were murdered, some of them managed to write some music. We have this music. 2013, we performed a concert of some of that music. I'd love to do that, perhaps persuade the Macau Orchestra, perhaps, to do an evening of something like that and turn it into a Holocaust a memorial event. Mm. And you've been working with um, researchers uh, in Hong Kong, Macau, and mainland China. Uh, is there any kind of epistemic community of uh, Jewish studies scholars in the greater China region? China's been amazing. China's extraordinary. Uh, Jewish studies, in, 1993, Israel and China established diplomatic mm -hmm. relations. And since 1993, there's been the a beginning of Jewish studies. And there are three, four people in, in China, uh, Xu Shen at Nanjing, Pang Wang in Shanghai, Fu Yuda in uh, Shandong, 
and Zhang Cheng Hong in uh, Henan Dashua in uh, Kaifeng. They were, the, they were the founders of Jewish studies in, in, in China. They've set up centers for Jewish studies. Nanjing has been very successful. Nanjing gets good sponsorship from wealthy American Jewish families, the Glazer family. It's called the Glazer Center for Jewish mm -hmm. Studies at Nanjing University. Doing great research, producing fantastic MA and PhD students who will then go on to teach Jewish studies in other departments. So Jewish studies is growing in China. They, amongst the Chinese population, amongst Chinese students, there's a genuine interest in Judaism, in Jewish culture, in Jewish philosophy. Um, and I think many Chinese say, and, I, and it's, it's, it's flattering, they, 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 they puzzled about how a people who, have been, who are so small, who have been so persecuted, nonetheless managed to survive and in many ways flourish. And there's something admirable about that, they think, and they want, and they want to study this and they want to know more about it. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. and, and uh, in 2010, uh, the Abelson Family Foundation, from you know the Abelsons, they very generously and kindly donated a lot of money, so that we can now every year take thirty Chinese scholars to Israel for two weeks, where they spend two weeks learning about the Holocaust, and so at, at Yad Vashem, the major Holocaust museum in the world, and so through this program as well, we have now taken about two hundred and fifty scholars to Israel. They've come back, and so slowly, 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 these people are also going on to teach Jewish studies, they're writing MA and PhD theses in Jewish studies. And so it's, it's, it's obviously a very slow process, but it is... It's taking shape, it's, taking it's coming shape. into fruition, and, I can see, right? And, and, and all of these people, I mean, most of these centers are teaching Jewish philosophy, Jewish religion, but they all recognize you can't teach about modern Jewish history without the Holocaust. So the Holocaust invariably also begins to form a part of, of that story. And then, of course, China played a positive role. 25,000 Austrian and German refugees went to Shanghai and survived the war because they were in Shanghai. So China has a stake in the story. And so this is, again, something I think many Chinese people don't know about and are, are really, I think, rightly pleased to find out that China played a, a positive role. Mm -hmm. in, in How different is it to raise awareness and talk about Holocaust for a Western audience, let's say European, Mm. Um, compared with an Asian, let's say, Chinese, European, let's say, British or French. Uh, well, it's difficult. It's difficult. But the fundamental thing about the Holocaust... Or German. Or German. Of course. But the fun it's difficult. Because the fundamental thing about the Holocaust, it was the murder of six million Jews. Most people in Asia have a very vague idea of who the Jews or what the Jews are. So you have to first give some background on Jewish history. Why were there Jews in Europe? in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. What were they doing there? Where did they come from? Uh, most Chinese people don't have a background in the Bible, so they don't know the stories of Moses and Abraham. and all. So you have to spend some time first giving them a background on who the Jews are, why the Jews were living in Europe in the 20th century, before you can move on to the Holocaust. Um, but I think it's very important. One of the things I try and do in class is point out some of the similarities, I mean, they're not, I don't want to, I don't ever want to push false similarities, mm -hmm. but Chinese communities have been very successful and therefore resented in parts of Southeast Asia. Yes. In Indonesia, in the Philippines, in Malaysia, Definitely. in Thailand, there's often a resentment against a minority who were seen as very successful. And my students will understand, when I say the Jews in Germany were resented because there were very few of them, but they were successful. And the population said, who are the Jews? Why are they taking mm -hmm. over? This is the sort of rhetoric you get today in Thailand and Malaysia and elsewhere. The Chinese control the banks, the Chinese control the economy. So that is one way... And that's a centuries-old story as well, a indeed, history as indeed. well. And of course there's the Nanjing Massacre. The Nanjing Massacre is not the Holocaust, but it, it allows students to think about mm -hmm. an atrocity which actually happened before the Holocaust, 1937. Um, we've just marked the 80th anniversary of, of the Nanjing Massacre. Uh, so, by using these other examples, and then uh, very importantly, by talking about contemporary genocides, whether it's in Myanmar with the Rohingya, with, the, with ISIS and the Yazidi, or in more recent memory, uh, Rwanda 1994, by bringing in these other genocides, 
students understand the Holocaust is not, we're not asking for special Jewish, you know, loud the Jews their moment. We're simply saying this is something that happened to the Jews, but it has enormously important implications for everyone because these events are still happening. 1948, the United Nations passes the um, Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. We've had Cambodia, we've had Rwanda, we've had East Timor, we've had the persecution of the Chinese in, in Indonesia, Darfur. So the United Nations makes these wonderful gestures, but um, never again doesn't actually mean what it's supposed to mean. And so I think it's important that students know this. That's why the never forget is a very important, so there will be a never again. So th th this is, uh, of course, uh, these are two uh, crucial pillars, mm. right? Um, what's the best way to, to ensure that? Well, yes, I mean, what was so moving about uh, Werner Reich's talk, talk yesterday to the students was, gave yeah, this very powerful talk about his own experiences in Theresienstadt, Auschwitz-Birkenau and Mauthausen. Uh, but at the end of it, he, his message really was, this only happened because people allowed it to happen. The bystanders, you have the victims, you have the perpetrators, but the perpetrators can only kill the victims because most of us stand by, most of us do nothing. And his message really is, no single person can stop a, a genocide, but if enough people say no, it's enough. Um, it's a very difficult thing. I don't want to cheapen the, the discussion, but I suppose, in a sense, you get this with this Me Too moment, this mm. Me Too movement at the moment, mm -hmm. where suddenly people are all coming out and making a big thing about it. That's great. Uh, but I wish they'd make a big thing about things like the Rohingya and, and, and the Yazidi in Syria. But it'd be fantastic if more people said, never forget, hashtag never forget or never again would be a good movement to start and maybe get people to, to, you know, to, to say to their local governments, to the local people, we have to do something about it. And I think if you have a groundswell of, of real sincere opposition, perhaps people will take greater note of it. But the problem, of course, is while something's happening a long way away, it's not my problem. Um. But we also have some sort of normalization of some of these practices. And, and another problem lies with relativism. And I'd like to take our conversation to the issue of Holocaust denial. Have you dealt with firsthand, like giving a lecture or interacting with a student or someone um, who openly or subtly is denying the Holocaust? Not in China or in Macau, Hong Kong, no. In but Europe, In yes. Europe. Europe, yes. Um, but I don't have a big problem with Holocaust denial. I, I, I don't think... I, mean, I have a problem with it, but I don't... It doesn't... Outright Holocaust denial. The Holocaust never happened. To me, it's so stupid <laughs> that I, I can't be bothered. If people want to believe the Earth is flat, let them believe the Earth is flat. It doesn't worry me. If you want to believe the Holocaust never happened, it doesn't matter. What worries me is when people relativize the Holocaust. When the Holocaust becomes, there's a, you know, some sort of incident somewhere, there's some sort of um, oppression, persecution, it's a Holocaust. No, it's not. Uh, all over the world today, people are being persecuted, they are being oppressed, but let's not use word, this is like the Holocaust, because it's not like the Holocaust. There aren't any gas chambers, there aren't trains, taking people a thousand miles across Europe to camps in Poland and elsewhere to use them as slave labor or to send them straight to the, to the gas chambers. That is the Holocaust. The Holocaust is the determination to kill every single, every single Jewish person in Europe and ultimately the world. Nothing, nothing else like that has happened. And so to call other things the Holocaust is to denigrate the Holocaust. If the Holocaust is all those things, then the Holocaust is nothing. If, if every time somebody feels persecuted, if every person is a fascist or a Nazi, yes, the, then by overusing those, uh, overusing uh, by calling your yes, school teacher a yes. Nazi or you know, someone you don't like as a bloody fascist, well then fascism isn't so bad. If they are fascists, yes, well yes. then. But do you see that growing? I mean, actually, and now with, with social media, uh, with a, a before an overly polarized kind of uh, environment, that 
is something that is becoming more common, right? Much more. I mean, the, the problem with, with the internet, with the web, is it allows so much rubbish to become mm -hmm. normalized. I, I was teaching my class last night about, you know, within a day of the bombing of the World Trade Center in New York in 2001, people were saying it was the Jews who did it. Um, the internet allows all conspiracy most monsters, theorists conspiracy to, theorists. to be given. And so things like the Holocaust also become, you know, this, you know, this is a plot to economically exploit Germany with compensation. And people love those arguments because it, it allows them to shift the blame. You know, it's not, it wasn't, because all, all, all of Europe is responsible for the Holocaust. I mean, the Germans did it, but everybody else stood by. Um, you know, mm -hmm. By 1942, the Americans and the British knew about the Holocaust, but it wasn't, the argument was it's not a military matter. We first have to win the war, and then we'll deal we'll with deal this. With so with saving the Jews of Europe was never a priority. Uh, and therefore, I think everybody, in a sense, is complicit, and it's easier to, to shift the blame, to say, well, you know, it's like this, it's like mm -hmm. that, it all wasn't really us. And I think that's, that is always the danger. Another danger, risk, uh, very real, is, of course, anti-Semitism and violent anti-Semitism, mm. which is real still nowadays, particularly in Europe, mm. both Western Europe and Central and Eastern Europe. Mm. Uh, how concerned are you about this? Is it increasing? Is it becoming more serious? I'm not sure how... And in the United States, of course, you also yeah. have this. We had, well, you saw that course, awful Charlottesville last year. Um, in England, you don't get that much violent anti-Semitism now. But what you get, which I think is, is, is often worse, is an anti-Semitism which is becoming almost acceptable. Um, there's been a lot of discussion recently where you followed about anti-Semitism within the Labour Party. Oh, yes. The, fo uh, the, the former Party. London mayor. Um, uh, Keith, uh, Ken Livingston. Ken Livingston, yeah. Uh, and others. And the Labour Party has more or less denied it. And they had a report by Mrs. Chakrabarty who basically said, nah, not a problem. And then she got her, she made a baron there shortly afterwards. Um, within, within, within Europe, especially within academia, within left-wing circles, there's increasing conflation of problems which might pertain to Israel to anything else Jewish. And so often criticism of Israel becomes entangled with anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. And so you blame, there might be an unpleasant, unfortunate event happening in Israel, but people don't say, ah, it's the Israelis, they say, ah, it's the Jews. And so they bomb a synagogue in um, Malmo in Sweden, as they did two weeks ago, or they destroy a cemetery in Manchester, as they did a few weeks ago. And so this becomes a way to attack the Jews. Um, and so anti-Semitism is, is this monster which we thought had died after the Holocaust. Anti-Semitism is... But it is keeps a, on coming back in, evolved, in surprising evolved, and unexpected ways. It's extraordinary how, because how if it comes to it is. Anti-Semitism until the 18th century was largely religious. Because the Jews aren't Christian, they are misguided, blah, blah, blah. In the 18th century, most people became irreligious it evolved into a racial thing. The Jews are a separate race. Now it's more political, isn't now it? It's more politi now, now, now it's more political. Now it's the Jew as the conspirator. The Jews control the economy. The Jews control the press. The Jews control da, da, da. So now it's a more political thing of seeing the hand of the evil Jew behind every political, and invariably that is conflated with, 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 with Israel. So even the World Trade Center, if you go on the internet, it says the Mossad organized. It's always the poor Mossad who are guilty for all that's wrong with the world. Uh, of course, there's a difference between criticizing Israel's policies and being anti-Semitic. Uh, those uh, who, there's some, some critics say that this anti-Semitism label is sort of a way to limit criticism of Israel's policies. What's your take on this? It's, it's hurt a lot. Um, it's, and nonetheless, I think it often is anti-Semitic for the simple reason that those people criticizing Israel, why aren't they criticizing Syria or Zimbabwe or many, many, many countries which have far, far greater problems than Israel? 
I mean, whatever you, Israel does have problems, undeniably, but Israel is a functioning democracy. Everybody who, has, who is Israeli, which includes 1.5 million Arabs, have the vote. Uh, you get Jewish doctors, I mean, the Arab doctors, lawyers, nurses, blah, blah, blah. Um, no doubt uh, there is a, a, a I, I don't know, there is an element of discrimination in Israel. There definitely is. But it's, but terrible things are happening in countries just across the border, all over the world. If those people were, if people were going on marches about repression in Iran or elsewhere, I'd say fine, but why, they're always, why is it only Israel that they protest against? Therefore, I think it is anti-Semitic. But you have a why, number why, of... Why reserve the criticism only for one, one country? But you have a number of many Jewish criticizing Israel's policies, sure. actually. That is very, very common within Israel and sure. elsewhere yeah. in if the you, world. If you, read, if you read Haaretz, the main, it's the main left, left paper in paper. Israel, um, I mean, most... The current Israeli government hates Haaretz yeah. because it's very critical of the Israeli government. And, and they are not anti-Zionists, right. they are Zionists, Zionist left paper. Zionists, yes. It's called uh, The Land, Haaretz. Yeah. It's, a, it's a Zionist newspaper. But it doesn't conflate problems with Israel as somehow the, the, the responsibility or the fault of Jews all over the world. Mm -hmm. And this, this is the danger. Of course you can criticize Israel, but as long as you criticize Israel in the same way that you would criticize another country. Why is Israel held to a different standard? Is, I suppose, what Jews find anti-Semitic about criticism of Israel. By all means, criticize Israel, but use the same criticism for others. But it's kind of inevitable, this kind of double standard situation, right? I mean, you don't, you, you hardly find someone who would be consistently... But I think it's racist. I think it's racist against people who are not criticized. It's uh, some of my thinking, the Jews should have higher standards. We expect less of you, we expect less of you because you're not white and you're not Jewish. And so in a sense, it's actually racist to think it's acceptable for African countries to behave badly or Arab countries to behave badly. This is what they do. But somehow we have to hold the Jews to a higher standard. And that, that's, it's racist to both. It's like saying there is a difference. Your point. Uh, is anti-Zionism a form of anti-Semitism? Yes, it is. It's saying Jews don't have a right to a homeland. Every, every people has a right to a homeland. I hope the Kurds get a homeland. I hope they get it soon. Um, why should the Jews be the one people not allowed to define their own identity? Why can't the Jews say our capital is Jerusalem? Why can't the Jews say this is a Jewish country? Why, why must, you know, no one has a problem with saying with Chinese nationalism or British nationalism or French nationalism, why should Jews not be allowed to say, this is our country, we are proud of it? Um, what's wrong with Zionism? I, d I don't get it. Mm. Uh, talking about, well, there would be a talk show on its <laughs> own, <laughs> talking about the situation in Israel and, and, pa and the Palestinian issue. Uh, is there a glimpse of hope for peace? Can we go back in time, just like to the day before, Itzhak Rabin was murdered and we can rebuild what was being uh, launched and was, had garnered wide support and consensus from the international community back then? I don't think so. I, 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 sadly, I, 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 I do think the Israel-Palestinian problem is, is impractical. I really, while both people want to live on the same piece of land, it's not. I, I honestly cannot see a way out of it. Northern Ireland was different. Other situations are different, but this, this, this is two people, one land. And unless they can find a way to live together. Um, because now, we, even now, because of uh, uh, this protracted problem, even the two-state solution is being questioned by some, mm. uh, of course, by different, or for different reasons, actually opposite reasons, a one-state solution could mean very different things, but, but th th that's, uh, for the first time in many years, uh, getting back on the agenda. Yes, I think, I think because the two-state solution hasn't worked, I think suddenly the one-state solution is becoming a possibility again. But I, again, I, but I can't actually see the, the feasibility of it. Um, because if, if that the will spell solution, a then, lot of trouble. Well, then it ceases to be a Jewish state. So I don't see Jewish Israelis accepting that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it is important Jews feel that they want a state in which, Jew, which, you, which you can be Jewish without prejudice, which you can be a majority Jewish state, the only majority Jewish place in the world. And the Palestinians, understandably, 
would well would want an equal share which they, they deserve they're entitled to but as long as palestinians not all but some palestinians preach a sort of political islam that this land you know it's, it's islamic land from the river to the sea mm. where jews have no place in this land well then you're not giving you're not, you're not making the jews feel very welcome either so i mean but both sides are problematic and the zionists some of the zionists that's extreme zionism want no arabs and extreme Islam wants no Jews. And but they are playing in each other's hands. I mean, they're confirming each other's extreme or heavily polarized narratives, right? They are. And unfortunately, they are the ones, as you say, with the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin, um, the, the extremes have become, yeah. the, the, the two extremes have now become much more influential. That, that, is, that is the great sadness. The center ground has disappeared. And, the, and policy is increasingly being dictated by the extreme, the far right Zionist, the far left or right, whatever they are, Islamists. Mm -hmm. um, and the middle ground is, is slowly, slowly sinking. Uh, and therefore I, I, I remain pessimistic about, the long t about any solution. I think Israel's gonna have to continue as a highly defended state for a long time yet. Mm -hmm. uh, now wrapping up our talk and coming back to um the um, very beginning of our conversation about Holocaust. Um, and, and again, this idea of the, what's the antidote for the banality of evil, quoting Hannah Arendt, mm. uh, this quintessential work uh, that I think we should always go back, not only to this volume, but to other works of, of uh, Hannah Arendt, uh, the antidote for, for, for this uh, banality of evil. Well, yeah, I, what, what Aaron meant, I think, when she talks about the narrative of mm. evil, for, you know, she's speaking directly about um, Eichmann in Jerusalem, Eichmann, yes. who comes across in that trial as a rather pathetic little man, a little office clerk. Mm -hmm. um, and she, I think she has this difficulty reconciling Eichmann with the enormity of his crimes. And I think but what the narrative of evil means, is my, my, my take on it, is the Holocaust would not have happened without bureaucracy. It doesn't... The Holocaust, yes, it took, it took the vision to kill six million Jews. Somebody had to come up with that idea. Mm -hmm. But it, it required, and this is the important thing to remember, it required an enormous amount of bureaucracy. There were, you know, in Berlin, there was a whole department which did nothing all day but work out train timetables. If the train leaves Amsterdam this time, it will arrive in Auschwitz this time, one hour to clean it, send it on to Berlin or wherever. So, the Holocaust was made possible. This is the banality of evil. This is the little cogs in the machine, the little petty bureaucrats that one meets all the time. When you, when you, when you want something done, it's urgent, and they say, no, I can't do it. It's the rules. No, I, I can't do it. I'm sorry, it's the rules. That is the banality of evil. It's people who are never willing to say, I will help you, or I won't do that. This, this, if I do this, it's going to lead to something bad. And no one in Berlin in the railway department or in the finance department, or any of those departments ever said, they knew what they were doing, they knew why the trains were going to Auschwitz, they knew what were on the trains. That the banality of evil is, is, is the little, allowing very ordinary people to be complicit in something bad. Um, and you see this again and again, something like the apartheid regime in South Africa. That was sustained because you had a bureaucracy who were willing to implement the laws, to write the laws, to pass the laws. So evil only happens because it doesn't require monsters. They said that Leonard Cohen's, is Leonard, Leonard, Cohen, Leonard Cohen's, oh, yeah, I think it was Leonard Cohen. No, it's uh, Dylan, who, who, what's his name? The one who won the Nobel Prize, Bob Dylan. Mm -hmm. His song about um, Eichmann, what was I expecting? A monster, green claws, red eyes? No, he has a nose, he has a mouth, he has hands. Eichmann was a monster, but he looked like you and me. Uh, the banality of evil is, is the, everybody doing their little bit to allow bad things to happen. That is how my understanding of banality of evil. And is that an antidote for that? Is, I think what, what, what the survivor was, what, what um, Mr. Reich was saying yesterday to the students is everybody, no one should be a bystander. If something is wrong, if something is not right, you must have the courage to say, I will not do that. Obviously, it requires courage. 
but it, but people must must be willing to stand up for their principles and say, no, I will not do that. I, if I do that and you do that and you do that, bad things will happen. If none of us do that, the bad thing won't happen. So let's find the courage and the integrity to stand up for what we believe in. That, I would say, is the antidote. Difficult, very difficult. But uh, I think the Talmud tells us we're not expected to heal the world but we are expected to, at least to begin the process. You know, we, have to, we, we have to start. Maybe the next generation, generation of they will complete the task, but we have to begin the task. That is our responsibility. And with this message of uh, integrity and courage, we wrap up our talk. Glenn Timmermans, thank you very, very much for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, fascinating stuff and my pleasure and our pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you. Thank you. And to you at home, uh, thanks for tuning in. We'll be back next week.